Today, every basketball player dreams of making it to the NBA. It has all the best players in the country, if not the best in the world. Every four years, the best basketball players in the country are chosen to represent the US in the Olympics. And every single one of these players comes from the NBA. Some of the best players representing other countries are also pulled from the NBA. I don't want to generalize too much, but if you're a professional basketball player, you're either in the NBA or want to be in the NBA. But this wasn't always the case. There was once a league called the ABA, a tiny basketball league that seems to have emerged out of nowhere. Just imagine if a new basketball league emerged today. Would anybody watch it on TV or go to the games? How would they even begin to compete with the NBA? Why would the fans watch those players instead of Steph Curry or James Harden? How could they possibly convince players like this to switch to the new league? Just think about how hard it would be to get LeBron to leave his NBA career to play somewhere else. It would be impossible. In the modern day, it's such a strange concept, I can't even really wrap my mind around it. So how was the ABA able to do all this? The ABA started in 1967. The NBA was already 20 years old at the time and already well established as the basketball league. From the beginning, the overall goal of the ABA was to force a merger with the NBA. As one would expect, the cost to purchase an NBA team was through the roof, but the price of an ABA team was about half as much. The investors were told that they expect the ABA to eventually merge with the NBA. If an investor were to buy an ABA team, it would soon be merged into the NBA, and then they would have their own NBA team. So if they buy now, they're essentially purchasing an NBA team for half price. Even if they could get the funding to get started, the ABA would have to think of ways to draw audience from the NBA. The NBA only had 10 teams, which meant there was a large portion of the country they were not reaching. This is where the ABA saw an opening. They would locate the teams in markets different from the NBA. The cities were typically much smaller, but allowed basketball fans in these areas to attend games and have a team to support. Instead of using the traditional orange ball, the ABA decided to use a red, white, and blue stripe ball. Many people at the time said the ball made them look too silly and people would have trouble taking the league seriously with it. But the ball was actually a big success. The flashiness of it fit in perfectly with the style of gameplay the ABA would become associated with. Personally, when I first saw the ball, I admit I agree with the critics and thought it was strange and distracting. But forcing myself to have an open mind, I could actually see how it could have its advantages. The fact that it is striped rather than a solid color allows the viewer to better see how the ball is spinning. The spinning motion makes for better predictions on where the ball will go and whether shots will fall or not. It also makes plays look more impressive when you can see exactly what's happening. So the question here is, um, why did you choose the uh, ABA over NBA? Well, I like the colors of the basketball. The other big difference the ABA offered was the three-point line. It wasn't yet used in the NBA. It's hard to think of an NBA without a three-point line, but they didn't have it at the time, and they were over 10 years away from adapting it. Most of the biggest players of the time were centers, and the general playing style was much different than it is today. The line was invented a few years before the ABA, but it was them who made it popular. It helped fuel the ABA's flashy style. They were characterized by high volume three-point shooting and slam dunks. There was a general lack of defense that led to more scoring. The ABA figured that's what people want to see, so they made it happen. In this time, the NBA branded themselves as serious and professional, whereas the ABA branded themselves as being flashy and entertaining. Think of it as having the atmosphere of today's all-star games. The ABA now had the funding to get started, as well as some great ways to separate themselves from the existing league. But what they didn't have was talented players, and without them, it's hard to attract an audience. In its first year, the ABA had 11 teams, but all of them had trouble finding an audience. Former players tell stories of looking in the stands and being able to count the number of fans. Something that still amazes me is that the ABA was able to convince NBA star Rick Barry to switch over to the ABA, helping them earn credibility. It's really difficult, and this is really an understatement when I say that. It, it was very difficult for me to make this final decision. 
Through the years of its existence, the ABA thought of some creative ways to get talented players. The NBA didn't allow college underclassmen. The ABA saw this as a perfect opportunity to steal these players early on, before they were even eligible for the NBA. All the teams would work together for the better of the league. The teams would make sacrifices so they could offer players opportunities to play in their hometowns, whatever it took to sign these players. In just three years, the NBA saw the new league as a possible threat and voted to work toward a merger, meaning that the two leagues would come together as one. However, the players didn't like this. They were benefiting from having two separate organizations competing over them. The NBA Players Association filed a lawsuit that prevented the merger due to antitrust rules. The lawsuit became known as the Robertson vs. National Basketball Association. It wasn't settled for almost six years. In 1971, Julius Irving made his ABA debut. Personally, I'm pretty familiar with him being a player on the 76ers and was aware he played in the ABA, but I didn't know his importance to the league. He was the best player in the ABA and would have been among the best in the NBA as well. The ABA drafted him before he was eligible to join the NBA. When he was eligible for the NBA, he came close to moving to the Hawks, but due to contract issues, he was forced to stay in the ABA. Throughout the years of the ABA's existence, they would host exhibition games between the NBA and the ABA, including an All-Star game in 1971, where the NBA won by 5 points. In the beginning, the ABA would lose these games, but as time went on, they improved. In 1973, the ABA went 15-10 against the NBA. In 1974, they went 16-7. And in 1975, 31-17. The reason for such improvement is the ABA's ability to attract more talented players. The issue with this is that for many of these players, including Julius Irving, the ABA was paying them more than the league could afford. The last year of the ABA's existence took place in 1976. In this year, they would host the very first slam dunk contest. Most of us have probably seen this Dr. J free throw line dunk. Well, it comes from this contest. In the same season, the lawsuit from the Players Association was settled and terms for a merger were finally agreed upon. The ABA season ended with only six teams remaining, the Kentucky Colonels, Spirits of St. Louis, Denver Nuggets, Indiana Pacers, New York Nets, and the San Antonio Spurs. The NBA would only agree to accept four new teams. You could probably tell which four of these teams ended up making it. For not being accepted into the NBA, the Kentucky Colonel's owner received a $3.3 million payout, the Spirits of St. Louis owner received a $2.2 million payout in addition to one-seventh of the remaining four teams' television rights in perpetuity, resulting in more than $300 million to this day. An agreement was made in 2014 that involved an additional one-time $500 million payment and an agreement to phase out future payments. There was one additional team called the Virginia Squires that went bankrupt just before the merger. They received nothing as a result. Toward the end of their existence, the ABA was failing. They were paying too much money to obtain players and couldn't land necessary television contracts. For these reasons, the NBA had the upper hand in the merger. Some terms of the deal included, the four merging teams had to pay a $3.2 million expansion fee, the NBA would not recognize the ABA's records, New York Nets had to pay an additional $4.8 million to the Knicks for stealing audience from their area, the Nets offered Julius Irving to the Knicks instead, but the Knicks declined. The four teams would receive no television money for the first three seasons and obviously had to pay one-seventh of the revenue to the Spirits of St. Louis owner forever. So here's a big question. Was the ABA better than the NBA? The records of the exhibition games between the two leagues suggest that the ABA was better, but we're not sure about the reasoning behind these losses. The two leagues traditionally played with two different sets of rules and a different ball. I know they tried to set all the guidelines in a way that was fair to both teams, but maybe it was hard to do. Maybe the NBA teams didn't respect their opponent enough to give them full effort. Or possibly the ABA fast style of play was just a bad match for the NBA's traditional style. It's hard to judge it all by this record. For me personally, I'd say the NBA was better. 
If you watch basketball games because you're a fan of the sport and respected for all the knowledge, awareness, competition, and teamwork it requires, then you probably would prefer the NBA. If you're a passive fan that wants to see some flashy plays and be amused for an evening, then you may prefer the ABA. The ABA is more fun, but the NBA has more substance. The true success of the ABA is the way it was able to improve the NBA. It popularized the three-point line that was soon adopted. The line changed the NBA's entire playing style, today more than ever. In the three-point competition today, what color is the money ball? It's red, white, and blue. The slam dunk competition we know today was brought to us by the ABA. They taught the NBA to be a little more exciting, all while maintaining that fundamental spirit and level of competition that helped make it the league it is. The story of the ABA is no secret, but it's been gone for over 40 years now and faded from most people's memories. For myself, I was always aware of it, but never really knew the full story. It's interesting to see the amazing things the Little League was able to accomplish, and the way it influenced the game we know today. If you have any thoughts on the topic, I'd like to hear them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.